Good evening, everybody. My name is Zach Kyes. I teach a new class at AA in addition to being the school's art director. So I'm especially uh, happy to introduce a graphic designer in the context of an architectural school and to introduce Stuart Bailey in particular. The song that was just playing uh, is by the English post-punk band The Fall. The refrain, you're always a work in progress, is an appropriate namesake for the lecture tonight. As the publication Stuart designs and edits is something of this spirit and could be best described as a constant work in progress. Stuart Bailey is the founding editor and designer together with Peter Bielak of Dot 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 magazine, whose content has a particular interest in critical writing and language, even in describing itself as a publication of art, des, muse, film, lang, lit, arc, etc. Stuart was one of the first students of the Verkplatz typography, a two-year master's program in Holland led by tutors Karl Martens and Viga Birma. Since then, Stuart has become a regular contributor to art and design culture as a writer, critic, editor, publisher, and graphic designer. After seven years of living and working in Amsterdam, Stuart has moved to New York where he continues to produce dot, dot, dot. Most recently, Stuart has set up a fully functioning print workshop, publishing imprint, and sometimes a bookshop on Manhattan's Lower East Side under the name Dexter Sinister with David Reinfurt. Dot 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 began its life as a graphic design magazine, fanzine, and journal with a strict critical vision featuring something like a manifesto on the cover of its first issue. Notably, this cover reappeared on a later issue with a significant editorial correction, three round, ellipse-like coffee stains casually marking the cover. The editorial evolution of the magazine might be best seen as a map, plotting a course away from graphic design as a subject in its own right, with its own theories, self-justifications, and dogma, towards graphic design as a practice defined by its relation and genuine fascination in other subjects. In a recent interview, Stuart talked about looking for an escape route from graphic design, which indicates to me more of a reaction to the term graphic design and the role ascribed to us than the actual practice of a graphic designer. This may have something to do with the fact that graphic designer has often functioned as a negative definition, as in, a graphic designer is not a writer, not an editor, not an author, not a reader, and not an artist. The list of topics Stuart emailed me to uh, a couple days ago included her heraldic design, print economics, Henry Ford, distribution, and painting by t telephone, which, which makes no such distinction. At least that's my reading. And then I'd like to end before Stuart goes with one line here from issue eight that says, I've been coming to the conclusion that graphic design doesn't exist, and you replying, that's a good theory, but what did I mean? <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, as Zach said, that, that song wasn't just chosen as an intro just for some nice music, even though it's the song of the year. Um, also because Zach made a, a beautiful poster out of it recently. Um, it's a song called Yawana, and I wanted to, to start with it for three reasons I realized on the way here. One was, as Zach said, just because the talk is, is very simply mostly consisting of work in progress. One of the lines is, you are always a work in progress. Secondly, because another line is, you're a moaner, and a lot of the, the work that I'm showing is the direct response to moaning about existing conditions of, of working, particularly in print production, but things that can also exist in a wider sense or to other disciplines. And thirdly, because of a more obtuse line, which is, it is the outsideness flavor of it, which I like particularly. And I think that might uh, chime with a lot of uh, the work or the ideas behind the work, particularly towards the end of the talk. A lot of the talk consists of small uh, excerpts of text, and the reason of this the reason for this is to kind of emphasize that the writing and the text is as much a part of the work as the visual work, um, as the visual side of the work. They're usually written by myself or by myself and somebody I work with called David Reinfurt, where they're not there captioned at the bottom. And they kind of punctuate the talk <clears throat> as a kind of series of chapter openings, and then, um, and then I'll, I'll talk about some visual things. It's only really three works in progress, and uh, the rest is trying to talk about models of economic production 
or two particular models of economic production. Uh, one is the assembly line model, and one is the uh, is what's called the just-in-time model. And I'm going to start with those as a kind of um, introduction, and then go on to the work. This might be a bit disingenuous to do this, but I'm, I'm going to sort of I'm a big fan of of that idea of never reading the lyrics to a a song while you're listening to the song. <clears throat> um, but I think here, just to remind myself of, of exactly what's being said, I'm going to read these as well. At the beginning of the 20th century, Ford Motor Company established the first widely adopted model of factory production, breaking down the manufacture of a Model T automobile into its constituent processes and assigning these to a sequence of workers and inventories. And sorry, there's a missing word there. And by assigning these to a sequence of workers and inventories, significant efficiencies could be realized. This assembly line approach utilized increasingly specialized skills of each worker on a co coordinated production line as the manufactured product proceeded from beginning to end. Large inventories, skilled labors, and extensive cap capital investment re were required. Design revisions were expensive, if not impossible, to implement and the feedback loop with its surrounding economy was largely absent. Complicit with its early capitalist context, manufacturing at this scale remained necessarily in the hands of those with the resources to maintain it. So, as it said, from the beginning of the 20th century onwards, this was basically a model that is sort of easy to illustrate with, with, the, with the automobile. <clears throat> but of course applies to, to any other uh, industry as well, more or less. There's an early Ford motor car with all the pieces on the car made and assembled completely separately by an individual worker or group of workers. You can see someone at the end of the, at the back of the picture there waiting for the, for the next car to move along to, in to, uh, to install the next engine. And as the quote also pointed out, the requirements of this system was large storage space, large factories, and a large workforce. And this model carried on almost unchallenged until the middle of the 20th century when an alternative was, uh, was proposed by Toyota that was against this idea of um, of producing in excess, of producing all the products up front and then having to sell them at a later date. By the mid-1950s, the Toyota Motor Corporation of Japan began to explore a more fluid production model. Without the massive warehouse spaces available to store inventories required for an assembly line, Toyota developed the just-in-time production model and inverted the stakes of manufacturing. By exploiting and implementing a fluid communications infrastructure along the supply line of parts, manufacturers, labor, and customers, Toyota could maintain smaller inventories and make rapid adjustments. A quicker response time was now possible, and products could be made when they were needed. All of the work could be handled by a wider number of less specialized workers, and design revisions could be made on the fly without shutting down production and retooling. The result was an immediate surplus of cash due to reduced inventories and a sustainable, responsive design and production system. Smaller warehouses, faster communications networks, responsive and iterative design revision, and projects, products made as they are needed, just in time. So that's where the, the name comes from, obviously, that it was more geared towards working on demand. So you get in a demand for X number of cars, you make X number of cars. There's no big storage space. The workforce are trained more to be more flexible in, in working along laterally along the production line and to be able to uh, suggest and implement um, improvements as it's happening. Here's an example of an early Toyota. And as an illustration of that, one of the early Toyota engines, um, which was Visually, it looks more as one piece, so there's, a, there's an obvious um, distinction between that and the early example of the Ford car, um, where the engine is developed not as separate constituent parts in such a big way, but in parts that, that form one module in itself. A romance. 
since its conception in 2000, dot 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 has immatured into a jockey serious fanzine journal orphanage based on true stories, deeply concerned with art, design, music, language, literature, architecture, and uptight, opti pessimistic, stroppy, revelatory ghost writing by friendly spirits mapping B sides and outtakes, pushing for a resolution in bleak midwinter through late summer with local and general aesthetics wound on an ever tightening coil. This description of the magazine that, that I founded and I, I continue to edit was the back cover of this issue, number 10, which has that revised uh, manifesto that Zach was talking about, which sort of flippantly had a, a number of coffee stains on it. Um, that was really just a, a reaction to how self-righteous the initial statement of intent sounded. And the text was trying to do a, a kind of textual equivalent of, of what this is doing, which is a, a compound cover of all the previous covers of the magazine, all the previous issues of the magazine. I happen to have this issue with me, which is number nine. You can see there one of the dots from the cover is included in the, in the bottom left of, the, of this cover. And I guess part of the idea of doing that was was just to emphasize that there's really no distinction, again, in the magazine between the text and the, and the image. Um, and it was also some kind of experiment um, where we were trying to reconfigure our own history of five years and ten issues. From the start, we'd always talked very much about never treating history as a kind of old, uh, timeline to be to be drawn from, but to to say instead that something that was written in 1914 will be treated in exactly the same way as something written last week, and it was much more about the conveyance of ideas or sticking ideas together or curating ideas in a way um, that that chimed with each other. Um, so for issue 10, instead of doing that with with uh, historical articles or texts from, from people throughout the 20th century, we decided to try and do that with our own uh, magazine. But at the same time, we were trying to emphasize it wasn't really a best of, it wasn't sentimental, or the drive to do that wasn't sentimental. It wasn't a kind of looking back um, or an excuse. It was more that that seemed just to be the logical next thing to do, to just kind of... Um, re-look at what we were doing or where we were going towards plotting a kind of next, a next step. And I guess around about this time, which is about a year ago now, <clears throat> we were also starting to realize how we could use the magazine in a more demonstrative way. And by that I mean rather than just having writing about a subject matter, you could do things to a subject matter, you could, you could demonstrate the point through how you treated it. That's not very easy to explain, but I've got some examples. Here, about four or five issues ago, we started rejecting regular advertising, um, partly just because of a stupid reason that it was always very ugly, and we, we were sort of interested in, is there a possibility of doing something with the advertising that, that isn't kind of aesthetically objectionable. We kind of, we kind of veer between being, look, appearing to be very democratic and at the same time be very fascist. When the magazine started we had this idea that it was a very open principle that the only thing we really wanted were people to write and design contributions um, as one thing, as a, as a synthesized contribution. And after getting the first examples of that from people and realizing how bad they were, basically. We kind of turned 180 degrees on that principle and, and just started controlling everything <laughs> quite strongly. Um, this was a, an example of then trying to, trying to deal with these adverts. We thought it would be an interesting thing to explore uh, somehow the economy of advertising by initially what we did was to offer people exactly the same template in the same way that these two are exactly the same format and change uh, and just change the colors so we would have 16 pages of adverts and you could choose to be green or yellow and that would be the thing that would distinguish you from the other adverts and we also had two specials one was a 
Oh, that time we had one special, which was a special black on black advert, which was just playing with this idea of the exclusivity of, of an advert that you couldn't particularly read um, very well. We did another one, which is around the time of the last Olympics, completely by chance, which was selling bronze, silver, and gold adverts, which cost a hell of a lot of money, of course, as well. Um, and, um, and a completely white advert, which went to the highest, highest bidder. And since, since that issue 10, which is the one I just showed the cover on, we've, we've just stuck to having the same format. But the advertisers pay per the level of grayscale of the background of the adverts with, again, a kind of stupidly obvious reason that the, the darker your advert background is with white text on the front, then uh, the more readable it is. And, and the lighter, so a 5% a five tint of gray will cost something like 300 euros, whereas a full black will cost something like 1,000 euros. So you kind of pay per gradient. So that's what I mean, right? like rather than, or as well as having a piece about economics or advertising or something, there were certain opportunities or certain spaces to be able to, to, to deal with these things or suggest these things in a more um, interesting way or a more active way. <clears throat> and this is the back cover of this issue number nine, um, which kind of doubled as a, as a piece about independent publishing and the nature of independent publishing, um, and at the same time wanting to show some examples of when publications or uh, studios have been particularly candid with their economics and with their accounts. It was basically because we're in a situation where we were getting funded by uh, the Dutch Arts Council for every other issue and we were more or less dependent on that happening. So, in other words, the profit that we made wasn't enough to sustain ourselves. But we kind of realized after, after eight or nine issues that that actually wasn't true. It was just the fact that the people that owed us money never paid us. And the reason seemed to be that we were small enough for them to ignore us without fear of us coming back at them with a solicitor or a lawyer. And if you try to apply for arts funding, at least in Holland, probably everywhere else, uh, and, and one of the costs that you suggest is that it's legal cost, and there's no way they'll accept that. So it seems to be a kind of oxymoron or paradox that, um, that until it says there at the end of that first paragraph, so the independent can be ignored as long as solicitor's cost is not in the vocabulary of arts funding applications. So it was partly just to <clears throat> discuss or point out that paradox. It was partly to have this red list at the end, which was a list of the people that owed us money. So it's mostly distributors, it's also uh, bookstores, and a few random enemies. And, um, and on the spine, I didn't put this on the, on the slide, but the spine is a kind of, <laughs> I don't know why I'm holding that if you can't see it, <laughs> but trust me. <clears throat> There's a, a, a list of the, the amounts of money, and this wasn't really planned, but it turns out, I don't know, if you, can you read that? Can you see what that says? So it's like at the top in black, there's a list of the cost, printing, authors, the editorial, and then the bottom in red is everything we owed, and that the two figures corresponded almost exactly um, with what we get funded, which was something like 14,000 euros and what we were owed by people, which is something like 14,200 euros. So it kind of proved itself exactly, which was surprising. And of course, there were a lot of knock-on effects of this, like Magma Bookstore refused to stock us anymore because they owed us 12,000 euros or something. <coughs> um, some bookstores called up the next day and apologized profusely and then paid into the bank account the same day. Um, the big the big debtors never responded at all, so it didn't have that much effect in that way. And then there was, there was one bad example with a Canadian bookstore who was actually, we knew the, the woman that ran it. It was, it was only for something like 95 euros, and it turned out the bank had made a mistake and not actually recorded it. And she only found out that we'd done this because she got hate mail from, from, from one of their customers. I think the idea of a, <laughs> of a bookish person sending hate mail was quite a nice 
So all was not lost. Um, so again, a, another example of how, as well as just having a piece about, say, economics or about independent publishing, then you do something demonstrative, you do something active with the piece. <clears throat> and a last example was, was this, which was a, a typeface that we kind of commissioned from a friend, which started out as being almost a joke. A lot of what's in dot, dot, dot is, is somewhere on the, on the tightrope between being serious and funny, hopefully, at the same time. And this was between a kind of brief given to a friend of ours called Radim Pesco, who was a, a kind of type designer. And every time I was designing each new issue, I'd always say to my co-editor, Peter Bielak, who's a type designer as well, isn't there, don't you know, some typeface that has triangular serifs, right? Serifs are the things at the, the bottom of letters um, that come originally from the brush, the brush stroke of painted letters. And he could never think of anything that wasn't a, a kind of obvious display font, so that would be too, too thick for, for using as a, as a text type. And I guess I was only interested in having it because it seemed like something that was that black or I always think of it as being quite bucolic as a, uh, as a typeface that didn't seem to exist, that didn't seem to be something that, that would make that, that very black mark and still be readable. It didn't exist, so that was, that was why we were trying to commission it. And it was also because we were interested in the idea that the typeface could develop from issue to issue, partly in the way that if there were things we didn't like about it over time or once we'd seen it printed or that Redeem himself didn't like about it, that we, could, that we could change it, but also that we would add a new member of the family every time. So, for instance, the last issue had an italic uh, face added to it as well. And the brief to him was really three things that you can see at the, the middle of that right-hand column. And it was to say, um, okay, the, the typeface should roughly be an amalgamation of these three <clears throat> existing um, forms. One is this Broadway typeface, which I came across in an edition of Time Out in New York, which is a pretty standard sort of Broadway theatrical flyer bill from the 1920s. The second you can't really see there, it's from a, uh, an avant-garde magazine you might know called Blast from the early part of the 20th century by Wyndham Lewis, who printed that um, you might have seen this, it's quite a known thing. It's always in the, in the, the V&A, for example. And it has a very specific um, typography, and it was printed by uh, an alcoholic printer who was the only, the only printer he could get to do it. So all these things have quite nice anecdotes behind them. And the last one, of course, is the, is the, the symbol for the artist formerly known as Prince, um, a kind of beautifully failed experiment. Just because that seemed to have... You know, when, it, when, you, when you see that, that was, that was the closest to saying what the form I had in my head should be like. So, and this is basically the, the result, the typeface. That's the first type specimen, which was also published in the machine. So again, I'm showing this not really to, to show the magazine, but just to show this idea of, of a piece or of a contribution that is a demonstration of something. My co-editor Peter had written maybe two or three pieces over the, the six years before this, which were dealing specifically with the idea of the history of a typeface or how you can revive something without it just being a parody or a pastiche, how you can try and use the spirit of something that exists already. So this was an exercise in trying to, to capture that, to deal with that. That was very explicit in the, in the nature of the brief. Um, and I guess I'm introducing this as well because I want to say something about the nature of, of models. So I'll come back to the whole just-in-time stuff later, um, but it's very much to, to, to kind of introduce this work as, as being, on one hand, just solutions to uh, design problems, if they're problems, or to, to producing publications or putting things out in the world, but at the same time as them functioning for what they're supposed to do, like a magazine being made for a certain readership, a certain audience, that they also act as some kind of model at the same time. So there's this kind of duality. That could be a series of principles, for example. 
What is ORG? There are four possible correct answers. ORG is an acronym that stands for many things. ORG is the graphic design practice of David Reinfurt. ORG is a constantly shifting configuration of designers openly sharing and assimilating others' ideas back into the larger framework. ORG is an org of orgs. End of report. Thank you. Have a nice day. Most of this work, as I said, is together with, with, a, with a friend and colleague, David Reinfurt. Um, and that statement was from when he set up his company uh, about six years ago, at the same time that I was setting up dot, dot, dot. So his idea for that studio was always as a very kind of open plan scenario with other designers drifting into his space in the fashion district in, in New York and drifting out again after doing uh, certain pieces of work. I'm just showing this one piece of work, which is, of course, his business card. And there's some background to this. I think it was something like the, the weight and the thickness and the distribution of the area of, uh, of the typeface of the text is directly linked to, um, to the US currency rate at the time of printing. Um, and I think a lot of this work has a sort of conceptual base behind it, but again, I want to emphasize that each of these things has to work, not because of that concept. That's a kind of, that's a way of getting to a point, getting to a form. Um, so they're kind of Im embedded in the projects. They're like anecdotes that, that I always think of as vibrating the projects. Um, and let's say this was an example of him doing this at the same time that I was making something with, with dot, dot, dot. I moved to New York about two years ago um, as one of those designers, itinerant designers that David's studio was set up for. So I kind of went, spent a month there. We did a project together. I was due to leave again, but I, I kind of wanted to stay, so I never really left. And at the time of me being there, he just finished making this catalog for an exhibition called Terminal 5, which was at the disused uh, terminal at JFK Airport. And it was a very typically ambitious and very flawed uh, New Yorkian kind of plan, which was a huge art exhibition, a lot of known artists that would all exhibit in the disused terminal. So very site-specific works. And David spent probably the best part of a year putting this catalog together um, under pretty dire circumstances and a very low budget. And this, I'm kind of showing this as, a, as an embodiment of what I think uh, um, a, a typical art catalog would, would look like, at least in terms of its size and its format, its glossy paper, its full color, apart from the cover. Um, so he just finished this. It's about 300 pages. It's, um, it's mostly pictures of artwork and some, some nice texts about the artwork, of course. Um, on the night of the opening, which sort of corresponds with me arriving in New York. Um, it was completely shut down after the opening because it was discovered by one of the artists that the super ambitious curator, um, who's a bit like Joanna Lumley to look at, um, was, I don't know why I said that actually. <laughs> I mean, that gives a very good impression of her, her whole uh, character. And um, she'd organized the whole show without securing proper um, insurance for any of the works. And one of the artists found out about this during the night and immediately withdrew his work, like literally lifted up a sculpture or something and walked out with it. And then a kind of riot ensued and everything went completely haywire. And so it was kind of notorious for a night. And of course, thereafter, there was no real reason for these catalogs, because it wasn't really documenting the fact that that had happened. It was much more of, of a publication that I guess would be on sale in the, um, at the exhibition itself, um, or at least uh, in the months or the year thereafter when it was, I mean, it was supposed to be going on for six months, I think, or something, so it would have this ongoing presence. And when I first arrived at David's studio, this was in one corner, which was 
um, which was a series of boxes of those catalogues, which remained there untouched for about a year and a half uh, afterwards until David moved out of the studio. And there was always this promise that somebody would come by to collect these things, and of course never did. And whether that was going to be the computer or the printer who never got paid, the computer, the curator, <laughs> or, the, or the computer, um, nobody ever really knew, but it was always this, this promise. And this seemed to stand, it was only by coincidence that there, there are also twin towers of boxes. I said that at a lecture in Korea and everyone went, oh, what, what did you just say? And you know they were just they were just kind of there as this totem to to something that we were talking about a lot at the time. We were both involved for quite a while in arts publishing, and typically in making catalogues for galleries and for artists. And especially for me, working in the Netherlands, where there's a situation now which I think is everywhere else in the world, but there's, there's, it just filters down to a smaller level also in Holland of there being automatically a publication or printed material made in association with, with any art show. And at some point it's just got written into the budget as an automatic thing without anybody ever asking really why. And of course, as, along with it being written into the budget, a certain idea of how it should be, so full colour, glossy paper, a certain size, a certain thickness, gradually sort of becomes the ubiquitous form. And in in doing projects like that for about 10 years and being very used to this site of boxes of publications that nobody ever wants in the backs of galleries or in bookstores eventually being pulped or trashed or incinerated was kind of depressing and I was having a lot of conversations about about why this was and how to uh, to maybe deal with it in working. One of the reasons is I think because, um, because publishing up until quite recently has, uh, has always followed the Ford model that I described at, at the start. So publishing has been a kind of assembly line model where, um, where a printer and a distributor and a designer and a proofreader and an author and an artist and a curator and an editor whatever, all have very distinct roles and of course in the last 10, 20 years because of everything we know, desktop publishing, um, the democratization of, of print and <laughs> printers and photocopying and uh, computers and scanning, um, that those roles have become increasingly blurred. Um, so increasingly publishing has approximated a model which is more like the Toyota model of lots of people doing lots of different jobs. Um, that doesn't really explain the reason for this situation, which is more, I think, to do with the fact that printing as it stands, lithographic printing, how most books are made, is really only geared to printing large quantities of material. So whenever you get a print quote as a designer, then it never really makes sense, for example, to print less than a thousand. And at a thousand, you're, you're kind of... The, the, that also doesn't really make sense in terms of it costing far more to produce than you can ever reasonably sell it for. Or at least it probably would if you sold all the copies, but as I said, usually I'm used to 60, 70% of those books ending up in terminal storage. Um, and I guess the people that I was talking um, to about this were all interested in, in wondering whether there is a way in which you could equate that just-in-time model of, of car production where you'd have uh, a system of producing books or printed matter that was more in, in, uh, in tandem with the, the actual demand. Um, and it just seemed that there was this disjunct, this kind of lack of fitting between what needed to happen and the technology that was set up to make that happen. So that's what we were thinking about at the time. This is when David moved out of his studio in the, in the fashion district about six months ago. So that's the boxes um, getting trashed along with most of the other stuff in his, uh, in his studio, um, which he, he pretty much gave away to, to friends. And we moved together 
to a very much smaller and cheaper space on the Lower East Side in New York. About the same time as this, as I just arrived and we were talking about all this to do with the, with the catalogues, um, we were asked to propose something for the Manifesta Art Biennial, which was due to happen right now, actually, in Nicosia, which is the capital city of Cyprus. Um, part of the reason for the International Foundation Manifesta, which is the mother organization for choosing Cyprus, was because of the, uh, the interest in the, the fact that that city was one of the last remaining divided cities. It's half Turkish and half Greek, like the country itself. Um, and I guess at the time I was being approached, or we were being approached and asked to make a kind of fairly standard graphic design proposal, which would mean something like a regular identity or logo, and would, uh, and would consist mainly of making a catalogue which would doubtless, in their minds, approximate something very much like that Terminal 5 catalog. So immediately it sort of seemed, well firstly, it immediately seemed like I should say no to doing this, which I pretty much did. Um, but at the same time there was this idea that maybe it could be a way of, of trying to resolve that or deal with that or suggest some alternative way of working. Um, so I was kind of in the process of, of, um, of trying to talk them into talking me out of the job and suggesting other people when they started telling me their idea for, this, for the biennial, which you might know is to establish an art school on the island, which didn't have one already. They were interested in questioning what it means to have an art school in 2006, um, what the nature of experiment is in art schools, um, looking particularly to the model of Black Mountain in college. And also for anybody that would attend, not to necessarily be an established artist as a regular biennial or art fair would, um, would have, but to question the idea of what it would mean to be a student there. So the idea wasn't necessarily to have a bunch of 20-year-old undergraduates, but just to send out an application form and whoever would justify their reasons for, for being at this kind of open form school um, would have the possibility of, of being admitted there. So at this point, being more interested in schools than making art catalogues, I kind of got involved, or at least David and I started talking about it, and we generated a proposal. This is from the proposal. We are interested in adopting forms and techniques relevant to the concept of a school without falling into prestige. Sorry. This is from the curator's um, proposal to the foundation. So this is their idea that they proposed uh, for the biennial. We are interested in adopting forms and techniques relevant to the concept of a school without falling into pastiche. An ideal school should be designed with a clear structure that allows for permanent change. Therefore, they propose to establish a local economy of production for all manifest six communication materials. Sorry, I'm wrong again. So this, <laughs> this, is, this is from a funding proposal that is written by the manifesto people based on our ideas. So it's actually mixing both, that's why I'm confused. This is what we were then proposing to do in Cyprus in line with what the curator's proposals were in terms of a school. So we were kind of um, sort of hijacking their foundations for, for making that proposal. Therefore, they proposed to establish a local economy of production for all manifesto six communication materials. Academies, schools and colleges already operate as de facto economic units. Meal plans, library systems and even grades stand in as common currency. For Manifesto 6, we will develop an economic model to dynamically regulate and facilitate production of printed and electronic materials by establishing an independent workshop and production mechanism. In a typical school, a text to be read by a class of 30 is photocopied by the teacher 30 times that morning. The same principle would govern the workshop system. Materials will be designed and produced when they are needed. Local affordable technologies will be bought or hired to operate this cottage industry for the three month duration of the Manifest 6 school. So, as is probably obvious, there was very much this idea of adopting this Toyota model. All activities taking place uh, in one location. 
there being a surplus of, of money up front to buy localized cheap technologies, which practically, at least in our heads at the time, meant old Xerox machines or mimeograph machines, spirit printers, anything that was particular to that community. Um, and that we would print or produce anything that was needed from uh, announcements of, uh, of exhibitions or film programs through to the catalog or at least existing documentation all using that same uh, technology. And the idea was very much that it would act as a kind of visible model, almost as a kind of dynamic sculpture, where you would see the process of this happening as a kind of, uh, as a kind of factory. This is the front of the proposal that we gave them, um, which was, the, the, these are pages on the floor of David's studio, the opposite corner to where the stacks of um, boxes were, which was which is called Little Cyprus for about two months. And this is during the process of, this is the work in progress of that project. And it's printed on the studio's fax machine, which we thought was the only technology, which was the only technology that really copied, so there wasn't a photocopier. And we thought we had to do something which would demonstrate the, the formal attributes, or the potential formal attributes of there were the payoff of this system because what we were trying to propose to them was less a kind of was less a, a standard design solution as such or an identity and was more like an economic system that they could implement and of course we were saying depending on whatever technologies those are or what the particular demands of the printed matter are that will yield a formal result and of course, then you expect people to say, yeah, but what does that formal result look like? Um, and by printing it on this fax machine, which has a very specific aesthetic, of course, was nothing to do with it wanting to, to look old fashioned or to have a kind of degraded quality, but simply to say this has a very specific form because of the conditions in which it's being made. Then we started, um, diagramming how this would work and David made these these diagrams which we sort of realized by turning upside down would um, would try and contain what I, our ideas were so in this diagram which is part of the proposal at the top you have this kind of <clears throat> Bauhaus triangle square and circle which represent something like an editor uh, and a writer and an artist or a designer. So people with very distinct roles, very distinct characteristics. And the, the printing technology in the middle and at the bottom a series of, so the, the kind of diagonal uh, uh, icons represent uh, bookstores or locations where the material that would be made in that information loop would be distributed. And by turning that upside down, the idea is that at the top you have a series of blurring roles. So those are the designers slash curators slash proofreaders slash editors slash whatever, who are all working in a very lateral way, still with the printing technology in the middle, but the, the shapes at the bottom now represent specific locations or specific circumstances in which that printed matter might exist. So you might make a certain version of a catalogue, for instance, for a certain location. An obvious example is maybe in, uh, in a certain language rather than a different language. Um, or a certain type of publication for the school and a different type of publication for, uh, <clears throat> for somewhere else in the outside world who isn't seeing that publication in direct relation to the, to the school or the biennial. And of course, this isn't anything new and it's nothing that's exclusive to this project. This is just something that happens right now, everywhere particularly. This is David taking a photograph of a FedEx window in New York, print it, sorry, make it, print it, pack it, ship it. The idea that everything is done in one location uh, very efficiently. And also coinciding with, with us talking about all this was, um, was print on demand, which you might have heard of, which is a series of internet sites which will, which will basically publish um, and print 
books and put those books available for purchase online all as one, um, as one service and very cheaply and very quickly. And there there's, a, there's an interesting thing that you can, you can even order one copy of that book as a fully finished printed book and the price range is completely exponential so if you order 10 it's just 10 times $6 rather than $6 for the first one. So it has a completely different economy, economy of scale as traditional printing would have or how those catalogues that I showed earlier would have. So this is something, something interesting and it, it just kind of happened in tandem of course. That, um, this is us in the studio in yet another corner making the proposal. And this is a list, I don't know if you can read that, um, where we were comparing, let's say, two models again. The just-in-time model, connected to everywhere, open, on the fly, fluid, blurred, current, networked. Um, I mean, you're all fam familiar with those kinds of terms. And the other side, which is called uh, coat of arms, which I'll explain in a minute, rather than assembly line, was referring to uh, a list of qualities which were much more fixed, which we're trying to be, which we're trying to say were the opposite of, of this flexibility of a system. <coughs> of course, I didn't realize, but the fall make another appearance there. The kind of uh, the idea of of changing a band every year, pretty much like a football team, rather than the Beatles, who are a fixed model. Heraldry is a graphic language evolved from around. 1130 AD to identify families, states, and other social groups. Specific visual forms yield specific meanings, and these forms may be combined in an intricate syntax of meaning and representation. Any heraldic device is described by both a written description and its corresponding graphic form. The set of a priori written instructions is called a blazon. To give it form is to emblazon. In order to ensure that the pictures, the pictures drawn from descriptions are accurate and reasonably alike, Blazons follow a strict set of rules and share a unique vocabulary. Objects such as animals and shapes are called chargers. Colors are renamed such as argent for silver or ore for gold. And divisions are described in terms such as dexter, which is right in Latin, and sinister, which is left. A given heraldic form may be drawn in many alternative ways, all considered equivalent, just as the letter A may be printed in a variety of fonts. The shape of a badge, for example, is immaterial, and different artists may depict the same blazon in slightly different ways. So at this point, we were thinking, well, it does, as well as proposing this, this workshop system, which was already a year in advance when we were asked to do this project, and saying we're offering this, uh, this thing that tries to deal with the economics of the situation, at the same time, we realized that there was a kind of need for some sort of fixed a symbol for all the printed matter or publicity or application form that would be made uh, during that year running up to the thing itself. And we became interested again in a sort of, I always think of these things as being almost stupidly obvious in a kind of lateral way, it's a kind of lateral thinking I think. Um, way in wanting to design a school badge for the new school. So we became interested in heraldry and did quite a lot of research um, around the traditions of heraldry and, and discovered that heraldry has its own vocabulary and its own grammar and its own rules for construction and a very long history and lots of anecdotes to do with, with its development. We, in that proposal, in the facts proposal, we <clears throat> did some examples of how it might possibly look without saying any of those possibilities were, were actually going to happen. So typically we were trying to just think, okay, how do we have to represent, um, let's say, the three main things about the school, which are the location for Cyprus, the fact that it is a school, and the fact that it's art or it's the basis of it is, is uh, an art biennial. And so we were doing kind of uh, almost, well, very much joking versions of the shield, which might have had a kind of Daniel Buren green and white stripe um, background with, 
We had one with, a, with an olive leaf, which is part of the, Cy the Cypriot flag with six leaves on because it was manifest as six. And we had one with a kind of mirrored lion's heads facing each other with their tongues out and touching, which we, we said when we did the proposal represented either dialogue between student and teacher or French kissing equally, which they didn't like. But we ended up, with the, we kind of proposed that, they accepted the proposal. And then we had to go away and um, think, okay, you spend all this time doing the research on, on heraldry, you propose a lot of things that you're saying, it's not going to be this, it's not going to be this shield, and not this shield, and not this shield, but it will be something. And, and then you have to design it. And it seemed really beside the point to kind of make something that was as literal as Buren plus olive branch plus lion heads, <clears throat> which seemed like the idea of pastiching, um, pastiching heraldry didn't interest us that much in the same way that the curators weren't really pastiching or parodying the idea of a school. It was to kind of build on a certain tradition, but at the same time, twist it or to, to play with it or to, uh, to criticize it. And we ended up just doing this, which was um, the most standard badge that you can have. Uh, in heraldry, all the things that surround the bad, the shield, um, like animals holding it up or a crest on the top uh, or a motto underneath, all of those are superfluous. And the only thing that you have to have to have a piece of heraldry is the shield. So we started with just that. And the idea of the diagonal line came from, uh, from an essay by, that was actually in an early issue of Dot 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 by a writer called Steve Rushton, who was talking about this situation or contemporary situation of people with these sliding roles. And then he was particularly talking about the idea of curator slash artist slash designer. Um, and we included that piece of text, which had an illustration of the shield very similar to this in the proposal. And then one day we were just reading that again and thought, of course, it's already, it's already there. So we just, we just use this, this shield, which is some kind of paradox in heraldic terms because the first rule of heraldry is that you distinguish your badge by a color. So this is a badge with no color. And there are lots of very nice um, sort of subtleties to heraldic tradition which are interesting and kind of make some nice poetic sense in terms of it being an art school. One is that the color white doesn't exist, which I think um, which is pretty interesting. And the reason for that is that because her heraldry was developed for primarily for shields in battle, which were always, the base color was always silver. So, um, so white didn't exist. You never had an enameled white shield. It was always painted a color on top of, on top of silver. Um, so this is actually a silver badge in heraldic terms. Um, but it's also a kind of, oxymoron, it doesn't really exist in official heraldry because it hasn't, hasn't got a colour. And after we'd proposed it and it was accepted um, and we started using it on various things, suddenly we got a call from the office in Nicosia in Cyprus with the, um, with the sort of chairman of the, the main arts body there saying, wait a minute, doesn't this represent the division of the country, the political division? We can't have this. And um, I think we replied something like, well, it also connects the two halves. You know, it was that thing of a logo, an identity can mean anything that you want it to mean. It was more funny that we just never even considered that when we were making it. And it's just the most obvious thing. So as that quote about heraldry stated, <clears throat> one of the main features of heraldry is that it starts with a text. The text comes before its graphic representation. And I always think of this as a bit like a game that I remember playing once at school, which is a teacher stood at the front of the class and she draws something on a piece of paper and then describes it to the rest of the class. And so it says, okay, everybody draw a circle in the middle of the page and a line going from the top left-hand corner to the top right-hand corner. And then everybody compares them afterwards and of course they're all completely different. That's what heraldry is like in that you could 
ask 10 different illustrators, artists, to draw a badge with a lion's head. And those lion's heads, those 10 lion, ten lion's heads could be completely different. But none of them would be right and none of them would be wrong because it's a text that is, is the right thing. So I think there's a, there's a nice kind of analogy to the text, which is called the blazon, um, being a kind of abstract representation. And the graphic, which is called the emblazon, or to emblazon the blazon, as being a representational form. We were kind of working backwards in making this because we wanted the graphic form first. So then we had to translate backwards to find out how you describe this in heraldic terms. By this time, we'd, we'd found kind of friends of friends who were involved in sort of heraldic secret Freemason societies and things. And the translation of this is party per ben sinister, which we thought was just a beautiful sentence anyway. And you know, partly just the idea of sinister being in there, which means left. I think I always get this wrong. Left. Um, another great subtlety about heraldry is that everything is always described from the user's point of view. So you describe something going from left to right as if you were holding the shield in battle rather than from the, the onlooker's point of view. So that's why people are always confused, like me, about the left and right. Um, and also just the fact that this sounds like a completely obtuse, weird sentence, a different language. And of course, having the word party in the, uh, in the sentence. Basically, bend, sinister, a bend means a diagonal line, sinister means left. So it's, and the party per is a kind of grammatical construct that is just like saying, this badge is. So it doesn't really mean anything um, specific. So party per bend, sinister means a badge with a line going from bottom left to top right as you're looking at it. Um, and we wanted to use both these things interchange interchangeably so the, the text and its graphic would be, would be one and the same. So for example, we were always, when we set up all their sort of publicity email templates, we always had this line party per Ben Sinister at the end of the email as a kind of almost like joking with the idea of this being a subliminal thing that people were asking, what does that mean? This is one of the first applications in, in Nicosia. This is the, the office um, of the founding organization. And this is on the street opposite, which is done um, the sort of night before we left the first time. Um, so you immediately have this, this reflection and done very much in, in I was going to say in the style of graffiti, obviously. But there was, for some reason in Nicosia, all the graffiti was black. And it wasn't really tags, a lot of it was, was, was sentences, was types. So it was kind of done very much in, with the local uh, vernacular. This was a, a badge we made, uh, which, is, which is completely silver. So it's a white silver school badge. And this was the application form, which went out in a number of art magazines. <clears throat> and the idea was very much to use that form, obviously, but not to just pour that content in there, but to use that division to sort of articulate the text. Um, so in every, in every case, we were trying to, um, just trying to use the basic form. So on the left, top left, you had this list of what was going to happen, the different departments that you might apply to. And uh, the bottom right hand side of the shield is the application form itself. There's a neon at, a, at an opening at a book launch in, in New York. For the only thing that, that ever really came out of this project um, in the end, which is this book, which is called Notes for an Art School. And I guess this spring sometime, the whole project got cancelled ostensibly for political reasons. Um, the real reasons are more like the founding organization in Cyprus hadn't raised a penny of the supposed one million or something they were supposed to raise. So my idea or most people's idea who know anything about it is that it was deliberately sabotaged. But it was portrayed as being a political issue that from, from, the, uh, from the organizational side that they said, well, we can't get 
permission for you to use Turkish venues. And because the whole point of being there was to sort of, um, um, I guess, very naively try and work with this division, um, it turned out to be the reason for it getting cancelled. This book was made um, last December, January, and it was printed at a place in Holland which was doing something very similar to what we imagined doing, which was a local community centre in a town called Nijmegen, which uh, for many years had developed its own uh, low circulation printing system with a machine that's a cross between a, a kind of Xerox machine and, a, and what's called an old stencil printer. And they'd invented their, their own ink for this, which gave a very specific um, feel. That was something in between a, a screen print and a, uh, a color laser jet print very vivid colors and it, and it just makes a very beautiful uh, object that with a very idiosyncratic uh, printing technique so we wanted to use that because we couldn't set our proposed workshop up for at that point another nine months um, and we wanted in a way just to practice we were intending to produce this ourselves at the community center um, but also like the fax thing as another example of the technology that you find making the way it looks, giving the way it looks. Uh, this is the inside. You can see this funny large margin, which isn't just a text ending. That margin runs in a kind of regularly irregular way throughout the whole book. We decided to completely use every parameter limitation of, of this uh, unique machine to design the book. So the format is a kind of strange long format. It's printed in two colors because you could print two colors at once. And basically every area that can be printed is printed, which is different from the maximum paper size. So that strange long margin at the bottom is because the printing area is different from the, from the sheet size area. So we were just using that, almost to be able to say, this is what we mean by the idea that it will look like the technology. So again, it was like a demonstrative, uh, active form. And that's the back cover of that piece of graffiti that you saw earlier. And slightly sadly, that's the venue that we were going to have the, the workshop at in Cyprus. Um, which now, of course, isn't happening. Um, quite quickly, two more pieces of, of work uh, before leading to how this was sort of reused in another context. At, that, at this point in time, we were, um, we were asked to make a poster for uh, a show in Brno in the Czech Republic that was curated by the, the guy that I started uh, dot, dot, dot with. And the show was called Graphic Design in the White Cube. And his idea was to commission something like 20 um, different designers to make a poster which would act as both the advertising for and the content of the show. So it would be a series of posters which were on the street in Brno at the, at the same time as, a, as some kind of uh, weekend graphic symposium or something. And then would be in hanging in the gallery in the white cube as well. And of course, he was trying to challenge the idea of uh, the, the dubious idea of showing design or graphic design, especially in an art context. Um, at the time, we were talking a lot about the telephone paintings of Laszlo Mahali Naj, the famous Bauhaus teacher, um, which is illustrated quite well by this quote. I was not afraid of losing the personal touch so highly valued in previous painting. On the contrary, I even gave up signing my paintings, put numbers and letters with the necessary data on the back of them as if they were cars, aeroplanes, or other industrial products. In 1922, I ordered by telephone from a sign factory five paintings in porcelain enamel. I had the factory's color chart before me, and I sketched my paintings on graph paper. At the other end of the telephone, the factory supervisor had the same kind of paper, divided into squares. He took down the dictated shapes in the correct position. It was like playing chess by correspondence. 
Thus, these pictures did not have the virtue of the individual touch, but my action was directed exactly against this overemphasis. I often hear the criticism that because of this want of the individual touch, my pictures are intellectual. It's a photograph of Maholi Naj by, uh, by his wife, Sybil, when he just moved to the new, uh, the new school of design in Chicago, the new Bauhaus. And kind of interesting for us as much as anything because of this, this posture of him wearing overalls, of being a workshop uh, worker with this kind of business suit of a, of a pedagogue underneath. Um, so because we were interested in the, the whole idea of, of, um, of the workshop, this seemed to be a very significant portrait. And of course he was claiming, as he says in this text, that the piece of art that he was that he was making, that he was duplicating five times in this example, wasn't a piece of art as it was traditionally known. It was more in line with a utilitarian functional object like a motor car. We decided that we wanted to take this sort of very known, very again stupidly obvious graphic form. Um, kind of a super aesthetic, almost like aesthetic in quotation marks, form, and use this uh, for the poster in the White Cube project. And the main reason for this wasn't to go through some kind of re-exercise of telephoning a printer in, uh, in Brno to get him to make, uh, a uh, to make the poster, um, but more to do with the idea of, of let's say, giving back this piece of art to design. The piece itself, the painting itself, is loaded with paradox because, of course, now you only ever see it behind glass at MoMA or it was just at the V&A or in the recent Maholi Alba show at the Tate. So it's turned into this precious object, which is completely the, obvious, uh, completely the opposite of Maholi's apparent stated intention. So we made this poster uh, which is used in the same forms, which are just measured from existing photographs that we had. And a certain logic of the division of the, the poster made itself apparent once we started doing that. I had it screen printed with the, with the information about the exhibition at the bottom. So this was hung both in the city and in the exhibition. Um, and we, the other thing that was interesting, I forgot to say at the start to us, at this time was that Maholi Naj seemed to be doing exactly the same thing that the, the difference between the text and the graphic form in heraldry was doing, meaning that he was speaking a form. It was the text of the form that existed first that was being transmitted to someone else who was going to make the, its graphic correspondent. So we called this piece or this poster um, Blazon for Maholi Naj. We were also interested in using something in heraldry um, for a long time, which was the fact that every color has a corresponding form of cross-hatching, um, which dates, I think, from just the fact of before color printing became common. Heraldry and heraldic rune, rules and vocabulary were, of course, printed in books, and there had to be a way of showing the colors in the designs without using color itself. And this was done so often or was deemed so important that um, heraldic societies agreed on a common color coding system, which is um, a kind of obvious sort of primitive version of, uh, of grayscale. Uh, and this was before halftone photography was introduced, which does more or less the same job. Um, so for this to come full circle, then a couple of weeks ago we made this, which is the same poster uh, in black and white, using you see a detail there, using a detail of uh, using the the colours to replace the black and the red and the yellow. At the same time as making this, all this happened at once. We were asked to make a, an identity for a um, for a series of books that are to be published by Columbia Architecture School. It's going to be called Forum. And um, here's an, an extract. The next text is from their introduction to the whole series, or the thing that they sent to us 
to introduce the project. Has art itself become a mere outtake, a long footnote to human history? In the United States, it is technology, not culture, that is regarded to be a space for innovations. Art, it seems, has overstayed its welcome. For the amateur artists, immigrants from the disintegrated homeland survive against all odds. Often they cross the border illegally and, like the diasporic repo men, try to possess, repossess what used to belong to them, reconquer the space of art. The amateur artists aspire neither for newness nor for a trendy belatedness. The prefixes avant and post appear equally outdated or irrelevant in the current media age. The same goes for the illusions of trans, but this doesn't mean that one should try desperately to be in. There is another option, not to be out, but off, as in off stage, off key, off beat, and occasionally off color. One doesn't have to be absolutely modern, as Rambo once dreamed, but off modern. A lateral move of the knight in a game of chess, a detour into some unexplored potentialities of the modern project. Um, this is by a writer and artist, Svetlana Boym, who's also Russian, which I think is no coincidence. In Russian literature, um, particularly um, um, Nabokov, Vladimir Nabokov, the idea of the, the knight move, the knight's move in chess, which is also always seen as this obscure move, like ahead and then to the side, rather than pure advance, is often referred to. And also elsewhere in this uh, introduction that they sent us was a quote by Viktor Shlovsky, uh, the, the art writer also from Russia, um, with a heavy chess influence, who was using the metaphor in the same kind of way. And so this forum project from Colombia was trying to align itself um, by, let's say, being a step to the side, um, not necessarily against the existing system, but parallel to it. That's just a diagram of the knight's move in chess. So in, in being asked to do an identity for this, the first thing we thought of was a big favorite of ours, which is the logo for Springer Verlag, the German academic publishers. And we always just like this kind of classic, almost heraldic um, form, also using, obviously, the knight's move in chess. So we were trying to think how we could basically do the same thing. And at this point, we were very much into the idea of, of how we could recycle this or reload such a, an existing idea that we already thought was pretty perfect. Um, in some new way. And we thought about the Bauhaus chess set designed by Joseph Hartwig at the Bauhaus in 1926, um, which you probably know is, um, is carved from pieces of wood where the form of the piece of wood always corresponds to the movement of the, of the piece. And so with the knight, you can see there it's a kind of... Um, it's not even an L shape, but it's more of a, of a corner. So this is what we were proposing to them as being the, the identity um, for the series. So this would appear on the front cover of each edition of the books. And then to take that a step further, this is shaded uh, with, the, with the heraldic cross hatching in red, yellow, and blue. Um, as like some cross between some sort of crazy soloit Lichtenstein crossover sculpture. In the basement at 38 Ludlow Street, we will set up a fully functioning just-in-time workshop against waste and challenging the current state of overproduction. Driven by the conflicting combination of print economies of scale, it only makes financial sense to produce large quantities, and the contained audiences of art world marketing. No profit is really expected, and not many copies really need to be made. These divergent criteria are too often manifested in endless boxes of unsaleable stock taking up space which needs to be further financed by galleries, distributors, bookstores, etc. This overproduction then triggers a need to overcompensate with the next and so on and so on. Instead, all our various production and distribution activities will be collapsed into the basement, which will double as a bookstore, as well as a venue for intermittent film screenings, performance and other events. This was from the invitation card um, to the opening of this basement space, where 
I guess a lot of a lot of the work that I've shown has been has had this kind of quality to it of in some way recycling an existing idea or an existing form. That isn't really the point, that isn't the starting point, but somehow that always seems to, to come into it. Um, and I think it's more about working with a language with, that already exists, like the heraldic language. In this case, we were basically just taking everything that we developed for, uh, for the workshop in Manifesta and applying it to a different context in New York. So we found this cheap space um, in the Lower East Side where we were planning to install machines. We've also opened a very small bookshop, you can see at the other end of the, of the studio there, which will, <clears throat> which will grow as it needs to grow. So at the moment there's two more shelves being made. Um, it also functions, of course, just as a regular design studio. Um, and all the rest of the activities, editing, whatever. There's the books available now. More than anything, at the moment, it really serves as a distribution point for dot, dot, dot. And again, I think about it in the same way I was describing at the beginning of the bookstore almost being like another piece in the magazine, another article in the magazine, in that it's, it's sort of demonstrating something about publishing rather than necessarily uh, writing it. And um, in the two or three months since it's been opened, in a very kind of irritating way in that it's only open on Saturdays from 12 till 6, and it only has, as you can see here, about 20 different publications, if that, um, then it's, it's serving such a marginal audience in a way that makes so much sense, particularly in New York, where there are probably only two independent bookstores that I can think of that are the equivalent of Triangle. Um, that it really al already in two or three months has found an audience to the point that it can virtually sustain the rent through sales within six hours once a week. This is the first publication that we made there, which is exactly the same <clears throat> book as the Notes for an Art School that, um, that I showed that we made for Manifesta, which we printed in 1,500 copies from this place I talked about in Nijmegen, and it sold out within a month. The idea was always then when it sold out, we would just go back there. The price rate was exponential. We just, the plates were already made up. We'd just print another 1,500. Um, but we can't do that because everybody's in legal court cases with each other um, about the, as much as anything else, the publication. So instead, we tried uh, a print-on-demand uh, service and we use this photograph, which is outside the Manifesto offices where that graffiti was made, as the new cover um, for, the, for the new publication. So this is, we, we printed 50 copies. You can see it, it was in the bookshelf um, in the basement space. We probably sold about half of those now. And it's also available for anybody um, online. That's like a big feature of, the, of Publish On Demand on the internet that anybody can just order a copy from anywhere else in the world and it will still only cost them $6, which is pretty incredible. And that's reusing the neon sign. Um, so it actually looks like a little mini red light district in the Lower East Side. I'll just end on a quote that was important for us during all of this um, by someone I guess you might know, being at the AA, which is Norman Potter, who is a... Um, described himself as a cabinet maker, but was essentially an architect, and most importantly, a teacher, um, and was a kind of, um, was always trying to recontextualize, re-emphasize a particular strand of modernism that isn't to do anything to do with style, but is to do with attitude, which is well described by that idea of the chest move as well, I think. And just to point to, again, to the fact that all these things I kind of think of as models. His, I think, greatest book was called Models and Constructs, and this is a paragraph from that. There is a certain sense in which we are wholly involved in metaphor and in which a small construct such as this, local to its context and wholly a one-off, may show some value also as a model, which will then be a model of address, of attitude and approach, rather than one of outcome or consequence. I do not want to strain its credibility further than that. In a more diffuse way, the same might be said of a small workshop. 
I hope, however, that by veering so alarmingly between the general and the particular, and between the realms of metaphor and practicality, I have suggested to you that every technical possibility has a wider equivalence and a positive need to seek relationship with its neighbours. There are many roles for your own future workshops, and I hope you will occupy them with devotion, intelligence, and high good humour. Good luck with your intelligence. <laughs> Inheritance. <laughs> Thanks. Do we do questions, or I don't mind. But I can play the song endlessly again. <laughs> I don't know if we need this. <laughs> Probably him. The work is sort of doggedly, uh, you know, th there's, a, there's a consistent horizon of like ideological ambition throughout the work that, you know, one could uh, crudely, if one was in, in, the, in the habit of ca ca categorizing things, you know, uh, characterize it as you know the conceptual end of sort of graphic design which is you know fantastic in terms of the integrity of the work do you ever ever get kind of tempted to say you know fuck that conceptual shit let's make some money because there's a sense in which this kind of work I mean, it's extraordinary work but like you said with the book the bookshop and the bookshelf mm. the audience to which it's aimed at Mm -hmm. and the audience which it can find is by definition quite limited or, or specialist and so on, or so and so forth. I mean, to what extent is that... I mean, it's interesting you, you saying that there's, it, it generates enough money for you to pay the rent, which at least is a sustainable economic model. Right. But you're presumably not going to buy a Porsche out of it should you ever want to buy one. So I just wonder, you know, because I know the work of Dr. 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 and. And it's extraordinary for its, I think, the relentless kind of integrity. With it. And, and I think a lot of the work continues to show that. But um, at some point, I was sort of almost hoping for you to drop in a clangor, you know, where, yeah, and then there I did this. There were a few this, in there. Then I did I this. I read that word wrong. Then I did this for the Sunday sport, you know, and they paid me £100,000 or something. You know, because if we're talking econ e economics... Um, well, the, uh, well, there's nothing about wanting to be small for the sake of being small. It's just whatever makes sense at the time. So, I mean, as you were saying that, my immediate answer was going to be, well, we are making money, which is why the basement can pay for itself. And, you know, that's, that's just with the bookstore, right? That's not through doing design work or editing or whatever. That's almost like a bonus that comes from somewhere else. So you could say that's pure profit. You know, so in that sense, I think it, of course it's a smaller scale economy or something, but that's all it is. It's still an economy. You know, it's, and it's also like there's, I like we sell something like three thousand issues of dot dot dot, and there's no reason I wouldn't want to sell thirty thousand, if if there was a mechanic to do that. So it's not about wanting to necessarily stay small or something, and at the same time, <clears throat> for all those jobs, I mean, I made money out of them. I I earned money as a designer or whatever for Manifesta and all those things. So it's not like a series of personal projects or something. If anything, it's just that somehow we can combine them in a very satisfying way, of course. And, and, and that would be, if anything, the goal of the, the bookstore, that it becomes... Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think within three months, if it can, if it can manage to sustain its own rent, then, of course, after that, Theoretically, it should make a profit. And I think the difference between that and dot, dot, dot is that we're completely cutting out any middlemen. And that's where the economics of dot, dot, dot went wrong. And that's why, I mean, it's almost a reaction, a direct reaction to that, of you know, having that cover with the, whatever, naming names to try and get paid. That not really working. And the bookstore is, in a way, just a, a way of you know, we sell a copy of the magazine, we get 100% of the profit. You sell it to a distributor. If, even if they paid you, you'd still get 80%. So, you know, it's not about some small scaleness for its own sake. I'm quite happy that, to I think what's interesting is that, uh, the, you know, particularly the bookshop uh, example, 
describes an economically sustainable model, you know, which where whereas the you know the the standard. I mean, what I'm getting at is, I think you know, a, a lot of people start out, you know, ultimately you just want to do what you want to do, and which means a kind of independent practice, which means you know not taking any compromises, blah blah blah. But b as soon as you situate that within a within pre-existing economic distribution network uh, e economies, yeah, yeah. Um, you're on a loser, you know, um, because you know if you go to a distributor, they take so much, the shop takes so much, and so on and so forth, okay. and then. I mean, I mean, the last thing I want to say is just, uh, you know, there's a particular at the moment, the last five years in particular, there's been no dearth of kind of uh, independent publishing. You know, there's almost too much. As mm -hmm. I mean, overproduction is everywhere, you know, particularly in, 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 with independent um, projects. Um, another question is how many survive, you know, after, like, you'll see a few issues and then things kind yeah. of disappear. And that's usually the kind of model because you realize at some point, People can't live off this anymore. Something well, has to pay the rent. Yeah, well, I always think that's more a question of people doing that, not being realistic with, again, the amount of make, the amount they make with the amount they're likely to get rid of. You know, it's like saying at the at the lowest end of something, you make a fanzine, and you can have this idea of, okay, let's make two hundred copies of something, and you know, you sell maybe five and give 30 away. And you could have done that in the first place, or you could make something just to give to one other person. So it's only that it's the surplus thing that makes it bad or something that makes it wrong. So each, each, individual, each individual project or publication has its own reality or not. And I think it's more these things just really exist because no one really thinks realistically about what is going to happen to it. It's just all based on what the last thing that was made did, which is the analogy back to those catalogues or something, you know, or indeed like a art biennial or an art fair that is done on the basis of the last one which was successful. Therefore, we step it up every time to the point where, of course, it's going to crash eventually. And I just think now in publishing, it, it, it has sort of reached that critical mass and that's why, in a way, it's no surprise that Publish On Demand is happening at the same time, because it's just a response to the same conditions. Um, and equally, you know, there's this, this thing that I was thinking about recently, which is also in a, in a dot, 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 of an interview with Judith Williamson, where <coughs> she's questioned about something with a similar implication the equivalent of would you do that for the Sunday sport or something, which was, you know, would you do work for, I don't know, a company with dubious ethics to make money? And she just replied, well, that ethic is only one politic. There's also the fact that, you know, you might have a child to feed or you might have <laughs> whatever. I mean, there could be any number of any hundred different reasons why you would take that also on a political ground, which isn't the obvious, you know, one that that question is trying to catch you out on. And I think that's, that's the only thing I think that really links everything, is, is wanting to question what that system is. And you might arrive back at the same point or the same design at the end of it, but I just think there's not enough kind of questioning of that. Like, why do we need a publication? What for? Why don't we just print ten? You know, and it's nothing about grassroots or small scale or new age. Or <laughs> it's just a sort of realism in a way, you know, which I do link as being a kind of line of modernism, you know. And if I align myself with that, it's that. It's just a questioning attitude or something. It seems like at the root of your, of some subsets of your question, you sort of like why does integrity have such a small audience? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just uh, sorry. At the back of my mind is, the f is just the fact that yesterday, you know, Goog Google bought YouTube for $1.6 billion, you know. YouTube was set up by a couple of guys a couple of years ago, you know, if that. And ditto MySpace and so on and, and all of these things, which, uh, and uh, these are really fascinating models where of kind of genuinely independent 
you know, practice, which, you know, it's not like they started out to be corporate whores or, or anything like that, you know. There's actually, there's a similar level, horizon, I think, of integrity, what they set out to do, as what many of us set out to do, you know. But by them choosing the medium, let's say, that they operate in, there's this perverse kind of leap that they make, you know, within a space that, you know, within two years, what could you do as an independent publisher? You know, you, you, your, your print run could go up from 500 to maybe 1,000. You know, if you're, if you're lucky, it's really not going to go from that, you know. So there's, I suppose, um, I mean, I don't know that it's not an answer. It's so much as a kind of a, a, a setting within which this kind of work now operates, which I think is very different to the setting even five or six years ago, mm. you know. I, and I suppose that's, it was just something at the back of my head, you know, in terms of... Uh, these kind of divisions that we always set up, or you know, ind independent versus corporate, and, and I think there's a kind of elision between <coughs> that that we haven't, we can't fully quite comprehend at the moment. No, I think it's p particularly in sort of any kind of design discourse, it's always just black and white, mm -hmm. and it's like that's what I'd object to, you know, that it's either this or this. Um, and at the same time, there's something that kind of re that that reminds me of, which I was reading recently, which I thought was really interesting about that what is the point of that dividing line between it being whatever too big or too small or you know the i don't know what the mathematic point is on an economy of scale but it's the tipping point i guess is what it's called right? and it was through a really weird context of <clears throat> reading um the writing of lester bangs you know the famous gonzo music journalist um and it was this series of pieces he wrote when he was touring with The Clash in England in 78 or something, and it was reprinted over three weeks in the NME. And he sort of came with this barrage of political questions to ask them, like, you know, once your initial popularity is over, like, what is going to happen to the politics? Like, is it just rhetoric or do you mean it? You know, that was the basic thrust of his questions. And he just describes for the first few days he was on tour with them, them just kind of laughing at him and saying, well, we're a rock band, like, what do you think about it? What are you going to do about it? Like, and, and then slowly he has this kind of realization that the way in which they, they treat the tour crew and the fans and the audience is so different from what he's used to, like having, you know, whatever, 10 years of being touring with Led Zeppelin or something. But it's like he was just describing how they build up this community that is completely, um, you know, <laughs> in, a, in a really stupid way with good manners rather than rock and roll excess or something. And he's so kind of blown away by this, he can't really sort of get his head around it. And just, you know, just from s simple things like, um, letting fans like stay on the bedroom floor or something and his whole point at the end is of after being amazed by this and he's, and he's kind of having this revelation where he's like this is what I wanted from rock and roll or something this is the flash I had when I first heard that first transcendent piece of music that somehow in some weird construct it would lead to a better world yeah. and then towards the end of that he starts pondering the question of what happens when they become, when there's so many fans wanting to stay in the room because they can't hitchhike back to Cardiff or something. What is the point where you literally can't fit that many fans <laughs> into the bedroom, you know, or they're sleeping three layers on top of each other? And there has to be a point of that, you know. And I just thought it was such a great sort of context. And I, yeah, I don't know either. And also with the magazine, it's like if. It's always a struggle to publish, it's always a struggle to fund. If someone offered to publish it, I'd be completely interested in doing that. I have no sense of it has to be independent for the sake of it. But it would have to be the right reasons. But the right reasons aren't necessarily the black and white that someone asking a question to me would, would suggest, but can be all sorts of reasons. Yeah. And um, yeah, but that's part of it. I mean, being open to that is part of it. Yeah.